Hey everyone, welcome to the Inner Realm Podcast. This is an exciting one for me because it's the start of the podcast episodes where I'll be talking about books. And there's nothing um, I'd love to do being a bibliophile than talk about books and expand on them and give my opinion on them. Uh, and you know, I was thinking about how I want to do this. How, how do I want to make this book review episode? I have watched a lot of book reviews online and I gotta say a lot of them generally are kind of like top five books I read this year or, or top 10 books I read in my lifetime. Now, The Courage to Be by Paul Tillich definitely falls, for me personally, it falls in that category of probably the top 10 books I've read in my life. I truly enjoyed it. Oh, enjoyed is, it's too little of a word. Uh, it, the book changed me, I put it that way. Um, and Paul Tillich is brilliant. But anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. The point I'm trying to make is, I was thinking about how I want to make this episode. How, how, how do I want to talk about this book? And a person who inspired me was David from the YouTube channel, Theory and Philosophy. Now, David, of course, studies philosophy. He, he's doing a PhD, or I think he's already submitted his dissertation and he's got, got the PhD, I'm not even sure. But he made some brilliant videos on the Frankfurt School. Especially one episode he did on uh, Makusa's One Dimensional Man, I just thought was was just brilliant. I, I I mean I'm so grateful that a person like him who has who is an actual philosopher in, in some sense, he's got an academic training. He's been through the the institution, unlike me, who's a internet bro philosopher, uh, a complete neophyte that really don't know what he's talking about. He is someone who's really studied these works and studied all these theories and talks about it really well, very eloquently, I might add. And he inspired me to really dig deep into this book, really not just not just talk about, oh, you know, this cool paragraph here or this really interesting paragraph here, but no, try and get to the essence of what the courage to be is about. And especially because, no, I understand one can't do that for all books. Like one can't do that for, especially an untrained person like me can't do it for Heidegger's being in time. People probably spend semesters or their whole uni career in their degree trying to study phenomenology and Heidegger's being, being in time. Whereas The Courage to Be, uh, Paul Tillich's, you know, specifically wrote it for a lay audience, for people like you and I uh, to think about these questions and, and kind of to, to bring it to the surface uh, of, our, of our consciousness, uh, questions that we don't even know that we're asking, but, you know, and he gets to that part in this book too. Questions we think, questions that we probably, probably that are kind of subconscious for us. You know, they're, they're there, we haven't got a way to articulate it, we haven't got a way to really pinpoint it, but I think he does it well in this book. Um, and that's why, you know, I said before that this is a great book. And even though I really tried, I mean, I have a long script where I'm probably going to have to take breaks in the middle because I'm going to read chunks and chunks of this book, uh, because I think that's the best way to do justice to it. Uh, really talk about the best paras, the, 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 you know, his most salient points, his most salient ideas, but I still can't nail down why I think it's a great book. There are so many reasons, and even thinking about this book vitalizes me, and that's true. For so for example, um, I'm a software engineer, and I've been trying to study for a few exams, and you know, as per usual, when one studies, one feels demotivated, apathetic, lazy, all of that, and generally my day would be where I you know, have my, my, my work day, uh, kind of like a nine to five, I work in my day job. And then afterwards I come, uh, I, I, I work from home. So I don't really come back home. I'm done with work. And then I would do some writing or some scripting. What I mean, what I mean by scripting is I'd write a, a script for a podcast episode. Uh, and every time I sat down and started writing the script for this, this podcast, uh, I, <laughs> it really vitalized me because after I'm done with the script, I do the studying afterwards for my exam. And I'd, be, I'd feel so motivated, I'd feel so inspired and I'd feel ready to go. 
And I think it's it's got a lot to do with the kind of ideas that Paul Tillich talks about in this book. Uh, so to put it simply, uh, The Courage to Be is a series of six lectures Tillich gave in 1952. So right after World War II and the, uh, well, I don't have to explain what happened there, the disaster that took place in the world. It's an attempt really for him to try and, as I said, bring to the public consciousness these existential questions, but also to try and understand how to be in the sense of being, how to be in this world and exist, and how do we continue to be? How do we, how do we sustain being in this world, living, really? Um, and as I said again before, it's an attempt to move existential dread, meaninglessness, anxiety, topics that he'll go into deeply in the book uh, that he believes are being overtly or unnecessarily intellectualized. That is these abstract ideas and he wants to uh, make everyone realize what these questions are, what these topics are, whether one is an intellectual or not. Anyone uh, should have access to these these ideas, let's say. Um, and, you know, that's pretty much the preamble. There isn't really a lot to go into as to like, what's the background of the book and all of that. Uh, I think just trying to understand what his intent behind writing the book is good enough. And of course, <laughs> as the uh, title of the book is The Courage to Be, we've got to start off by talking about courage. So the first one third of the book, I did find a bit difficult, you know, especially when he was talking about Greek antiquity, because I haven't read a lot of work by, uh, by ancient Greek philosophers. I've read a few stuff by Aristotle and like Plato's Republic, all of that, but he really tries to define uh, what courage is. Um, he'll talk about uh, a dialogue that Socrates has, uh, it's called Lashes? Is that how it's pronounced? I'm not sure. I believe it's pronounced as Lashes. It doesn't matter. Uh, just go and Google L-A-C-H-E-S and that was a dialogue Socrates had about courage. What does it mean to what does it mean for someone to be courageous? Uh, he brings in the Stoics. He brings in Spinoza, a very interesting part there. Of course, Aquinas, uh, and then uh, kind of as he works towards about page probably fifty or sixty, he brings up Nietzsche, who had a massive influence on Paul Tillich, who he believes is like the epitome of this idea of the courage to be, with you know Nietzsche's whole doctrine of the will to power, um, and. I'll start off by defining uh, courage. Um, well, not really by defining courage, I apologize, but by giving, giving, uh, reading out a paragraph by what, what Paul Tillich, how Paul Tillich describes the way uh, Greek, Aristotle and the Greek, ancient Greek philosophers saw courage. So, so this is from uh, chapter one, being in courage, courage and fortitude from Plato to Thomas Aquinas. Perfection for Aristotle as well as for Plato is realized in degrees, natural, personal, and social. And courage as the affirmation of one's essential being is more conspicuous in some of these degrees than in others. Since the greatest test of courage is the readiness to make the greatest sacrifice, the sacrifice of one's life, and since a soldier is required by his profession to be always ready for, for the sacrifice. A soldier's courage was and somehow remain the outstanding example of courage. So just to, I should have, you know, had that preamble before this para, para. In the previous paragraph or in the previous section, he talks about, they define courage as how a soldier acts, essentially. Then we get to courage and wisdom as defined by the Stoics. In Socrates, the heroic courage of the past was made rational and universal, a very ancient Greek idea to universalize everything, something that uh, Kierkegaard writes about in Fear and Trembling. A democratic idea of courage was created as against the aristocratic idea of it. Soldierly fortitude was transcended by the courage of wisdom. In this form, it gave philosophical consolation to many people in all sections of the ancient world throughout a period of catastrophes and transformations. So courage wasn't just seen and manifested in the soldier, but even the common person who wasn't a soldier could be courageous. 
The description of stoic courage by a man like Seneca shows the interdependence of the fear of death and the fear of life, as well as the interdependence of the courage to die and the courage to live. So this is kind of what Paul Tillich tries to explain in the book. Uh, of course, I only read two paragraphs really, but the first 60 pages are him trying to flesh out these ideas. Uh, I'm not going to go too deeply into that because frankly, it's only uh, after the first one third. In the, in the first one third, he's sort of warming up his ideas, really building up his points. But it's afterwards, he kind of comes to his point of climax and really, you know, hits it home and really expounds on what he means by courage. Um, and here's what Paul Tillich essentially means by courage. Now, this part, this paragraph I'm about to read is actually in the first page, but he kind of makes this point and then gets to the part where he looks at courage or view, uh, has to study his courage historically. But in the first page, he says, uh, for him, courage is essentially a self-affirmation and in spite of the threat of non-being. So let me, uh, I, I didn't, you know, put that clearly. The idea is we all have as a, as a, concomitant result. Concomitantly, we all have the risk of non-being. There, there's, if, when there's being, there's also the risk of non-being. And for Tillich, to put it plainly, courage is self-affirmation in spite of this threat, threat of non-being. And of course, for Tillich, courage is ontological. So in chapter one, he says in Being and Courage, courage is an ethical reality but it is rooted in the whole breadth of human existence and ultimately in the structure of being itself. It must be considered ontologically in order to be understood ethically. The ontological question of the nature of being can be asked as the ethical question of the nature of courage. Courage can show us what being is and being can show us what courage is. So you can see the interdependence that he's trying to create there on the point I made before where he talks about you know courage being the self-affirmation in spite of the threat of non-being so it's because of this threat of non-being in some sense ontologically courage exists and by understanding what courage is courage is ontologically we can understand the ontic nature of being itself um, now Speaking about being, ontology, a very, uh, I don't, I, I wouldn't blame you, let's say, or, or, or a very uh, normal thought to have is, oh, Tillich was probably influenced by Heidegger. And you're right. He was heavily influenced by Ta Heidegger. Maybe, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think Nietzsche and Heidegger had the most influence on Tillich and probably even Sartre. Um, and there are some great papers. Uh, I was gonna read out excerpts from them, but then I realized some of these papers are, they're pretty much, like the, there's what I think, I think the second thesis is like 300 pages. So they're books on its own. I mean, the courage to be itself is only 150 pages. So, and then it's, I'll just leave the link down below if you're interested, please go read, uh, read the papers. I didn't read both of them. I'm still getting through them, but clearly there have been many scholars, there have been many, Academics trying to uh, explain uh, the structure, structural relationship of Heidegger's idea of Dasein and his metaphysics with uh, Paul Tillich's theology because he was heavily influenced by him. Uh, especially the first paper here, the, the Heideggerian legacy in Paul, Paul Tillich's ontology and theology is a really good one, the first paper. But, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll leave all the links down below. So I was talking about the idea of non-being uh, before when I was saying that, you know, self-affirmation in spite of the threat of non-being. So it's important to understand what does Paul Tillich mean by non-being? Um, because it's funny, uh, maybe I was thinking about this. I kind of get this hunch that by understanding what Paul Tillich means by non-being, by that negation, let's say, it gives a better understanding of what he means by being. Because you know, much like Dasein, much like the Heideggerian idea of being, it's really difficult to understand uh, what being is. You know, that's like a huge, probably one reason people are a bit averse to existentialist 
phenomenological kind of thinking because it, it's really hard, you know, like is being, is being a person, is being consciousness, what is being? Therefore, I thought it's better trying to define non-being as to how Paul Tillich defines it, of course, than trying to make sense of what being is. So in chapter two, being, non-being and anxiety, he talks uh, the, the section, an ontology of anxiety. Here's how Paul Tillich defines non-being. Certainly non-being is not a con concept like others. It is a negation of every concept. But as such, it is an inescapable content of thought. And as the history of thought has shown, the most important one after being itself. If one is asked how non-being is related to being itself, one can only answer metaphorically. Being embraces itself and non-being. Being has non-being within itself as that which is eternally present and eternally overcome in the process of, divine, of the divine life. The ground of everything that is not a dead identity without movement and becoming. It is living creativity. Creatively, it affirms itself eternally conquering its own non-being. So when, it, when he means uh, creatively, it affirms itself, that's being. It turns its uh, being, affirms itself eternally conquering its non-being. As such, it is a pattern of the self-affirmation of every finite being and the source of the courage to be. Now on non-being, Tillich also talks about anxiety. A big part of this book is really about anxiety, as a matter of fact. And uh, he talks about the three types of anxiety and the nature of man. Because obviously, non-being is connected to this anxiety. So it, it is pertinent uh, to the discussion of non-being, uh, telekin non-being, let's say. Non-being is dependent on the being it negates. Dependent means two things. It, first, it points first of all to the ontological priority of being over non-being. The term non-being itself indicates this, and it is logically necessary. There could be no negation if there were no preceding affirmation to be negated. And in chapter six, certainly the best chapter in the book, the last chapter and the best chapter in the book, uh, you know, in regards to non-being, he, in the section, the power of being, he says, the faith which makes the courage of despair possible is the acceptance of the power of being, even in the grip of non-being, even in the despair about meaning, being affirms itself through us. The act of accepting meaninglessness is in itself a meaningful act. It is an act of faith. So I understand, and when I was writing the script, I did, again, feel this may be the case. Without the build-up, without the context, these paras probably seem meaningless. They, they seem like nonsense and, and, you know, kind of like a philosophical fruit salad, just, just mush or it may seem like a bit obfuscated. Uh, it's, it's not the case. Uh, I'm, I'm reading these paras as, maybe, maybe take, take it this way. I'm reading these paras only to give intimations of what the book is about, because I can't read the whole book, obviously. But these points are very, very salient, as, as all the other points, po po these points become very salient and really kind of come at you when there's context within the other points, if that makes sense. Um, so in, in, on the question of courage, he, this is an important part I want to add here. I don't know if this falls under non-being. However, I would say uh, it definitely falls under courage because Tillich talks about the courage to be oneself, the courage to be an individual, the courage to affirm oneself, self-affirmation, as I spoke about a couple of times. But he also says the other element of courage, the other structure of courage, speaking ontologically, is the courage to be as a part. So he says that we all feel worthless. No question about it. We all feel that we are worthless. We all feel that we are inadequate. I feel that a lot, especially these days, I've been feeling that a lot, that, you know, that we're incompetent, that we are undeserving. And 
you know, some people might take this as a very oh, peculiar, twisted kind of false modesty, but really it's vanity. You know, we, we may we may want to want to think that by being very self-effacing or having a negative view of oneself that we look humble and, and in that sense that's a vain act because it's still uh exhibitionist it's self-seeking i'm not talking about that i'm, I'm talking about when people genuinely sense but really feel worthless when they really feel that they are undeserving that they don't deserve the good in their life they don't deserve any good at all in fact and then tillich says to be courageous is also not just being self-affirming, but also having the courage to be as a part, having the courage to be a part of being itself. So he says, the, the, the in spite of that, you know, he talks about the in spite of the threat of non-being, that also applies that courage necess necessitates, it's a difficult word to say, courage necessita necessitates the in spite of our unacceptability we still choose to be accepted. We know very well that we are worthless, that we are un unacceptable, but still our courage for it to manifest, we choose to be accepted. I hope that made sense. I'm really trying here. <laughs> so in chapter six, again, his best chapter, he talks about courage and transcendence, the courage to accept acceptance. So even accepting acceptance is a big part of the structure of courage. One could say that the courage to be is the courage to accept oneself as accepted in spite of being unacceptable. Accepting acceptance, though being unacceptable, is the basis for the courage of confidence. The conquest of the anxiety of guilt is also the conquest of the anxiety of fate. The courage of confidence takes the anxiety of fate as well as the anxiety of guilt into itself. It says, in spite of, to both of them. So you probably can see a common theme, this idea of in spite of, you know, when it comes to anxiety, when it comes to the idea of being unacceptable, when it comes to the threat of non-being, there's always an in spite of. It, it's never a around it. It's never a evading it. It's always a confrontation of it. And then in spite of that, affirming oneself. This is the genuine meaning of the doctrine of providence. Providence is not some theory about some activities of God. It is the religious symbol of the courage of confidence with respect to fate and death. For the courage of confidence says, in spite of, even to death. So for those that are not religious or for those that are, let's say, non-Christian, providence is the idea of this, uh, how can I put it simply? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a whole theology on its own, but... The idea of that we are saved by Christ, by the grace of God. And Christ comes and saves us. Now, for me, I always found that to be a bit of a an odd idea where it seems like we play no role in being saved, theologically speaking. And I realized, oh, the way Tillich puts it here, even to be saved, it requires courage because it's something we need to do from our, from our own volition we need to choose to be accepted by Christ, by God, by the divine, in spite of our genuine feeling of unacceptability. And that takes courage. Um, and this is a part which, you know, I don't, I don't think the next part where the, the courage is creativity is a big part of the book, but I would say he spends a, a good amount talking about the idea of courage is creativity. And personally, for me, this really spoke to me because he says, and I, I've, I've read this in by some romantic poets, by some existentialists um, who talk about courageous creativity is a part of the divine. Any courageous act, any act of creation itself is a part of the divine. And he says in chapter four, courage and participation, the courage to be as a part. And of course, this being as a part is connected to creativity, which means creativity is connected to courage. The bearer of this creative process is the individual who, as an individual, is a unique representative of the universe. 
Most important is the creative individual, the genius, in whom, as Kant later formulated, it, the unconscious creativity of nature, breaks into the consciousness of man. Men like Piccadilla Mirandola, Leonardo da Vinci, Joe Dano Bruno, Shaftesbury, Goethe Schelling were inspired by this idea of a participation in the creative process of the universe. In these men, enthusiasm and the rationality were united. Their courage was both the courage to be as oneself and the courage to be as a part. So in, you see why I added this part, because in, in the in courageous creativity, there's this beautiful amalgamation of both, of the courage to be as oneself and the courage to be as a part, which for Tillich structurally is what courage is made up of. And in that sense, it, it's something transcendent, which is why he connects courageous creativity with the divine. Anyway, back to the paragraph. The rest of it says, the doctrine of the individual as the microcosmic participant in the creative process of the macrocosm presented them with the possibility of the synthesis. And most importantly, courage is a form of being in the world. And as I said before, not a banner Heidegger's influence on Tillich. Courage is definitely not a mere theory. It's not a mere abstraction. It's not a mere, um, it's not something one could detach oneself from and contemplate the way a, a Descartes would. Not at all. Courage certainly is a embodied act. And I got this line from um, the YouTube channel, Eternalized. I don't know the person behind the channel, but it's a great channel just to get high level views of or views on philosophy and, and different thinkers. Um, encouragement is the embodiment of courage itself. So <laughs> to really encourage someone, it, it, it's, it's also an, an embodied act. And to encourage oneself is really taking upon that courage onto oneself. Uh, it's really important. And I wanna say this um, before I end this section on courage. You know, Tillich as a man himself, he really seemed like an admirable individual. Uh, I've read a lot about him ever since I got uh, exposed to his work a couple of years ago. I've read a lot of articles about him and, you know, I I read online, I, I mean, I think in some legitimate source actually, I think John Mavaki was talking about this, that he was one of the first non-Jewish professors that were dismissed from his position due to his opposition to Hitler and the Nazis. Well, if I didn't mention already, uh, he was a German. And when, you know, the, the Nazis were coming to power, very early on, before they even had any real influence, he condemned them and he told them that, uh, he condemned them and told them that, uh, you know, this idea that this the whole Nazi ideology, it's, it's a corrupt form of romanticism uh, and it's this fanatical response to the, uh, it's a fanatical and pathological response to the threat of non-being. And he was very vocal about it, which is why he was dismissed and eventually he had to flee Germany. Um, so he definitely was not someone who just wrote books and philosophized and theorized all day. He embodied it. He seemed like an, he's the kind of person that I would say I, I'd, I'd look up to and admire and try to, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I can't believe that I've lost that word. Not, not replicate. Let's put it as, I would like to follow in his footsteps. I'd like to be that, that sort of man. Uh, and which is probably why uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was heavily influenced by Tillich to the point where MLK even wrote his dissertation on Paul Tillich. So definitely everything he writes about in this book, they are, they are, more, than, more, they are more than theory. They're more than abstract theory. The next section of the book, as, as much as courage is prevalent in the whole book, the whole book is about courage, but a big part of the book, especially uh, towards the latter part of the book, is about anxiety and meaningless. Now, of course, Paul Tillich beautifully threads it all together and connects courage and being and anxiety and doubt all fit together. And then he very clearly elucidates how uh, modern people are our biggest peril, our biggest, our biggest current anxiety 
is the uh, the anxiety of meaninglessness. And then he goes a bit into how it's manifested in different ways in movements like the Nazis or the communists or in literature and philosophy and art and how we can see it in modern society. Um, and again, as I said, most of the book is about anxiety. So in chapter three, this is a chapter a bit early on. He talks about pathological anxiety, vitality and courage. And then he says, he comments on the nature of pathological anxiety. Anxiety is awareness of unsolved conflicts between structural elements of the personality, as for instance, conflicts between unconscious drives and repressive norms, between different drives trying to dominate the center of the personality, between imaginary worlds and the experience of the real world, between trends toward greatness and perfection and the experience of one's smallness and imperfection. So you can clearly see the way he's trying to show that juxtaposition there. Between the desire to be accepted by other people or society or the universe and the experience of being rejected, between the will to be and the seemingly intolerable burden of being which evokes the open or hidden desire not to be. All these conflicts, whether unconscious, subconscious or conscious, whether unadmitted or admitted, make themselves felt in sudden or lasting stages of anxiety. Now, how beautifully put, huh? I mean, haven't we all at least had intimations of what he's describing here? That, that conflict he talks about, the internal conflicts, that inner war that goes on in our souls. Um, and especially as modern people, don't we all feel this anxiety? This, this kind of absurd nature of the universe. I probably feel it every morning, <laughs> if I'm being honest with you. Um, and uh, I, I struggle with it a lot too. So that anxiety has different responses. One of them, of course, is the pathological nature of it, which would be um, the Nazis, for example. And I want to make this point. I think this is something, I don't know, maybe Jordan Peterson even... I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've heard Jordan Peterson talk about this. He probably does because much like Tillich, Peterson too was influenced by the existentialists. Um, you know, again, we all experience this phenomenon, but, and then one could say, the question isn't why, why people are anxious. You know, in, in one society, we always try to pin, uh, uh, pinpoint or point fingers at social media or some external factor. You know, given the reality of being, given our thrownness into this world, to use a Heideggerian term, the question isn't why people are anxious. The question is why we aren't in perpetual fear and trembling to death. You know, why we are in constant fear and trembling in the Kierkegaardian sense and dying from anxiety. The question is actually, how are we not anxious? It's a better question to ask, in fact. So on to this idea of anxiety. Here's how Tillich responds. And this is one of my favorite parts in the book. I, I love the spot so much. <laughs> Courage does not remove anxiety, sing, since anxiety is existential. It cannot be removed. But courage takes the anxiety of non-being into itself. Courage is self-affirmation in spite of, namely in spite of non-being. He who acts courageously takes in his self-affirmation self the anxiety of non-being upon himself. A very, very important point. I can't stress it enough because Tillich is very clear here where he says that one, we can never get rid of anxiety. We can never evade it. You know, in contra contrary to the, uh, what our mod modern medicalized mental health obsessed society tells us, anxiety can't be just cured. It, it can't be jettisoned from our existence because it's an existential reality. All human beings to a certain extent are gonna feel anxious by the mere fact that we are alive. It's an essence to our being, I'd say. The only thing one could do is to take this anxiety of non-being, however it manifests, into being itself and act courageously. And for me, that's just, you know, keeping aside the metaphysics and the ontology and all of that, that seems like a practical way to deal with that existential anxiety, that existential dread at times.
And in uh, chapter two, being, non being an anxiety to like says he tries to provide an ontology of anxiety. You know, uh, I want to say he does talk a lot about ontology, probably because of his influence by Hegel and, you know, his in influence by the German idealists. But a lot, this book, in many ways, this book reads like a practical self-help book in some sense, <laughs> uh, where one doesn't have to get too carried away by philosophical terms like ontology or, or even metaphysical debates here. Just the way he puts it in, in, in my opinion, rather plainly, it seems like a practical way to deal with these existential problems we all face, uh, or, or let's say, not even existential problems, ex existential realities, because how, how, who am I to say that anxiety is a problem? It's just, it's like saying this chair is a problem. It's the chair, is, the chair is the chair. I'm not gonna place any value judgment on it. It's an, it's an ontological reality. Anyway, back to the uh, chapter two. Fear as opposed to anxiety has a definite object, as most authors agree, which can be faced, analyzed, attacked, endured. One can act upon it, and in acting upon it, participate e in it even in the form of struggle. But this is not so with anxiety. It's very important to understand the distinction there. Fear has a definite object, but anxiety doesn't. Because anxiety has no object, or rather, in a paradoxical phrase, its object is a negation of every object. The basic anxiety, the anxiety of a finite being about the threat of non-being, cannot be eliminated. It belongs to existence itself. There you go. So, there is no cheating, meaninglessness, and anxiety. It's a, a, a part of being. It's, it's concomitant with being. It's an, it's an essence of being human, let's, of being human, let's say, human. God, I sound like a New Yorker. <laughs> um, one shouldn't cushion oneself, uh, cushion oneself from the existential blues of being. This is part that I added, this is not what Tillich says, but I really do feel sometimes that, that anxiety, it does feel like blues. Now, I'm not a particularly anxious person, but I definitely, going back to the idea of uh, feeling worthless and the courage to be as a part, Many times I feel inadequate. And that inadequacy hits me like a blow at times. And I've come to realize that I can't evade it. I need to face it and that requires courage. And I don't even know if, if, if that requires courage or by facing it, I become courageous. I don't know which comes first. I don't know if uh, the necessity for facing anxiety or the threat of non-being, let's say, is courage, or by facing it, one becomes courageous. Nevertheless, courage is in the equation. So, but, but so is anxiety, meaninglessness, feeling worthless, all of that is still in the equation. They aren't evaded. And speaking about meaninglessness, to like, here's how he puts it, um, again in chapter two, being, non-being, and anxiety. The anxiety of meaninglessness is anxiety about the loss of an ultimate concern. If you've read Dynamics of Faith, another great book by Tillich, uh, he definitely digs a lot deeper into the idea of ultimate concern and absolute faith. Anyway, I'm not gonna get, go off on a tangent there. I'm just gonna stick, back to, stick to this book. I will make a video on Dynamics of Faith soon. The anxiety of meaninglessness is anxiety about the loss of an ultimate concern of a meaning which gives meaning to all meanings. To use a very contemporary term, meta-meaning. Um, this anxiety is aroused by the loss of a spiritual center, of an answer, however symbolic and indirect, to the question of the meaning of existence. The anxiety of emptiness is aroused by the threat of non-being to the special contents of the spiritual life. A belief breaks down through external events or inner processes, one is cut off from a creative participation in a sphere of culture. One feels frustrated about something which one has passionately affirmed. One is driven from devotion to one objection to devotion to another and again onto another. Because the meaning of each of them vanishes and the creative eros, uh, by the way, on the topic of, on the word eros, 
Philip was also influenced by Freud. So you can clearly see that here. And the creative eros is transformed into, the, into indifference or aversion. Everything is tried and nothing satisfies. The contents of the tradition, however excellent, however praised, however loved once, lose their power to give content today. And present culture is even less able to provide the content. Anxiously, one turns away from all concrete contents and looks for an ultimate meaning, only to discover that it was precisely the loss of a spiritual center which took away the meaning from the special content of the spiritual life. But a spiritual center cannot be produced intentionally. And the attempt to produce it only produces deeper anxiety. The anxiety of emptiness drives us to the abyss of meaninglessness. And then a point that is ubiquitous amongst the book is that, again, the way he says that being, non-being cannot negate being if there wasn't being in the first place. Therefore, being itself takes upon non-being. He says, the destruction of meaning is itself a meaningful act. Now, I told you, when I, when I read this, when I, when I read this in a few places in the book, I thought, is this wordplay? Because I do know it's it, it sounds rather romantic. It, there's, there's a flow to it. Is this wordplay? I don't think so. I, I don't think so, again, given... When he says the destruction of meaning is itself a meaningful act, I don't think it's mere wordplay given the context of how he places that sentence. And that's important. Because, because Tillich is an existentialist, therefore for Tillich, the only way to overcome meaninglessness is by living. Therefore, even when one feels meaningless, one should just live, one should just act and and partake in this world and affirm oneself, both the courage to be as a part and the courage for uh, self-affirmation. I'll probably keep repeating those two points because there's such important points in the book. And again, thinking about Heidegger's influence on Tillich, you know, for Heidegger being or design, it's beyond consciousness even, it's beyond reasoning. The only way it exists is by existing. And on the topic of Heidegger, let's get to existentialism because Tillich, of course, is a Christian existentialist. He was heavily influenced by existentialism. And I gotta say, um, I've read out this para on previous episodes. I think in the pre last episode I did uh, on the uh, Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment episode, um, I've it's gotta be one of the most palatable explanations of existentialism for a neophyte like myself. Uh, it's quite hard to define what existentialism really is, but Tillich pretty much does it in two pages. And I picked out these excerpts that I think are the best parts from those two pages. So in chapter five, courage and individualization, and uh, the section, the existential attitude and existentialism, here's how he defines it. The existential attitude is one of involvement in contrast to a merely theoretical or detached attitude. Existential in this sense can be defined as participating in a situation, especially a cognitive situation, with the whole of one's existence. This includes temporal, spatial, historical, psychological, sociological, biological conditions. And it includes the finite freedom which reacts to, the, to these conditions and changes them. An existential knowledge is a knowledge in which these elements, and therefore the whole of existence of him who knows, participate. The word participate is key here. The self, which has become a matter of calculation and management, has ceased to be a self. It has become a thing. You must participate in a self in order to know what it is. But by participating, you change it. In all existential knowledge, both subject and object are transformed by the very act of knowing. Existential knowledge is based on an encounter in which a new meaning is created and recognized. You may have a precise, detached knowledge of another person, his psychological type, and his calculable reactions, but in knowing this, you do not know the person, his centered self, his knowledge of himself. 
only in participating in his self, in performing an existential breakthrough into the center of his being, will you know him in the situation of your breakthrough to him. Bravo. It's beautifully put. I, I love those three paragraphs. And then, of course, uh, this is going to be a big chunk of... I think this is this is two pages that I'm going to read off right now, and I kind of have to. I have to because existentialism is so important in my opinion, not just to understanding Tillich, but just for our lives. It's such an important mode of being. Sorry, it's such an important way of thinking because it it itself emphasizes the importance of being and the important importance of participation. Therefore, I'm gonna really try and read out these couple of paragraphs, which is a lot, because it, it's important to convey uh, how Tillich sees the 20th century existentialists. And in here, he talks about the courage of despair in contemporary art and literature. This is in, the, this is in chapter five, by the way, uh, courage and ind individualization. Okay. The courage of despair, the experience of meaninglessness, and the self-affirmation in spite of them are manifest in the existentialists of the 20th century. Meaninglessness is the problem of all of them. The anxiety of doubt and meaninglessness is, as we have seen, the anxiety of our period. The anxiety of fate and death and the anxiety of guilt and condemnation are implied, but they are not decisive. When Heidegger speaks about the anticipation of one's own death, it is not the question of immortality which concerns him, but the question of what the anticipation of death means for the human situation. When Kierkegaard deals with the problem of guilt, it is not the theological question of sin and forgiveness that moves him, but the question of what the possibility of personal existence is in the light of personal guilt. The problem of meaning troubles recent existentialists even when they speak of finitude and guilt. In Kafka's novels, The Castle and the Trial, the unapproachable remoteness of the source of meaning and the obscurity of the source of justice and mercy are expressed in language which is pure and classical. The courage to take upon oneself the loneliness of such creativity and the horror of such visions is an outstanding expression of the courage to be as oneself. Man is separated from the sources of courage, but not completely. He is still able to face and to accept his own separation. In Sartre's The Age of Reason, the hero faces a situation in which his passionate desire to be himself drives him to the rejection of every human commitment. He refuses to accept anything which could limit his freedom. Nothing has ultimate meaning for him. Neither love, nor friendship, nor politics. The only immovable point is the ultimate freedom to change, to preserve freedom without content. He represents one of the most extreme forms of the courage to be as oneself, the courage to be a self which is free from any bond, which pays the price of complete emptiness. In the invention of such a figure, Sartre proves his courage of despair. From the opposite side, the same problem is faced in the novel The Stranger by Camus, who stands on the boundary of existentialism, but who sees the problem of meaningless as sharply as the existentialist. His hero is a man without subjectivity. He is not ex extraordinary in any respect. He, he acts as any ordinary official in a small position would act. He is a stranger because he nowhere achieves an existential relation to himself or to his world. Whatever happens to him has no reality and meaning to him. A love which is not a real love, a trial which is not a real trial, and ultimately an execution which has no justification in reality. There is neither guilt nor forgiveness, neither despair nor courage in him. He is described not as a person but as a psychological process which is completely conditioned. Whether he works or loves or kills or eats or sleeps, he is an object among objects, without meaning for himself and therefore unable to find meaning in his world. 
He represents that destiny of absolute objectiv objectivation against which all existentialists fight. He represents in the, it in the most radical way without reconciliation. The courage to create this figure equals the courage with which Kafka has created the figure of Mr. K. And then he has another, another section on the courage of despair in contemporary philosophy, specifically on Sartre. Sartre draws consequences from the earlier Heidegger, which the later Heidegger did not accept. But it remains doubtful whether Sartre was historically right in drawing these consequences. It was easier for Sartre to draw them than for Heidegger. For in the background of Heidegger's ontology lies the mystical concept of being, which is without significance for Sartre. Sartre carried through the consequences of Heidegger's existentialist analysis without mystical restrictions. This is the reason he has become the symbol of present-day existentialism, a position which is deserved not, not so much by the originality of his basic concepts as by the radicalism, consistency, and psychological adequacy in which he has carried them through. Now, this is a really important line by Tillich. So, really, I'm going to try and be as clear as possible when I read this out. I refer above all to his proposition that the essence of man is his existence. This sentence is like a flash of light which illuminates the whole existentialist scene. One could call it the most despairing and the most courageous sentence in all existentialist literature. When it says that there is no essential nature of man except in the point that he can make of himself what he wants, man creates what he is. Nothing is given to him to determine his creativity. The essence of his being, the should be, the ought to be, is not something which he finds, he makes it. Man is what he makes of himself, and the courage to be as oneself is the courage to make of oneself what one wants to be. A very good uh, description, I think, of Sartre's work, even though I haven't read Being in Nothingness. It's uh, on my list. But clearly, as you can see, uh, Tillich takes the existentialists rather seriously, and I also do like, unlike some, you know, evangelical, I don't know, theologians, I wouldn't really call them that, more like evangelists, they tend to be very dismissive of the existentialists. And I, I truly admire Tillich that he took the existentialists seriously because they speak of some ultimate truths, some, some important realities of being human. And uh, here's where the idea of freedom infinity, now Tillich talks about this in a couple of sections, but I think he goes into this more deeply in his book, uh, in his volume, in his uh, series, uh, Systematic Theology, which also is something, I don't know if I could make a video on that, uh, if I could record a podcast on that. I might try, because it's a great book. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm still getting through volume one. Uh, in any case, getting back to this before I go, go off on another tangent, <laughs> Tilly talks about the idea of freedom infinity. So, in, in that sense, Tillich's Christian existentialism, or let's just say Tillich's existentialism, does transcend the binaries of both modern materialistic determinism and the Sartrean radical freedom, where Sartre, for Sartre, in some sense, as the line clearly says, uh, essence precedes existence. Sorry, existence precedes essence. Uh, for me, honestly, as much as I enjoy reading Sartre's work, especially his um, plays like like Noza or like Noja or, or No Exit, um, I, I find his philosophy and God, I can't believe I'm saying this a bit naive, <laughs> really, uh, with this, this idea of radical freedom. Um, I don't know if I, if I if I should even say, say such, such things because uh, I mean, who the hell am I? I'm talking about probably one of the most influential philosophers in the 20th century. In any case, I do like how Tillich does transcend both those binaries. Uh, and I want to make this point here. He does transcend the, again, the evangelistic kind of this submission to God where in his theology, it's not like we don't play any part in our salvation or in our courage to be as a part. We are very much involved in it. And 
being involved in it is a courageous act. Uh, and of course, he, he clearly rejects fundamentalism. And he says that it, it fails to make contact with the present situation, which is why he smartly and wisely has taken the existentialists seriously without being cynically dismissive of them. The point Tillich makes is that we have to find our freedom through, of course, self-affirmation and self-assertion through our finitude. Through it, though, not despite it. The fact that we have this existential finitude doesn't mean we have no freedom. As a matter of fact, he'd say it is because of this finitude we are free, paradoxically. And in chapter two, he clearly says in, in the anxiety of guilt and condemnation, man is essentially finite freedom. Freedom not in the sense of indeterminacy, but in the sense of being able to determine himself through the decisions in the center of his being. Man as his freedom is free within the contingencies of his finitude. But within these limits, he is asked to make of himself what he is supposed to become, to fulfill his destiny. In every act of moral self-affirmation, man contributes to the fulfillment of his destiny, to the actualization of what he potentially is. Beautifully put, the idea is we find freedom, true freedom is found in this finitude. And this is where he gets to, again, chapter 6, as I said, the most important part of the um, whole book, which is the idea of God. And he ends it, even though, you know, it's really interesting. <laughs> this is at least ostensibly a, a Christian book, let's say, a book on theology. But very rarely he talks about God, or very rarely he even mentions biblical verses. So anyone who's not even a Christian, or even people who are averse to Christianity, or religion could read this book and get a lot of it. And again, chapter six is beautiful. Uh, it's the courage and transcendence, the courage to accept acceptance from that section. And he says, courage is the self-formation of being in spite of the fact of non-being. Uh, it is the act of the individual self. Did I read this part out already? Let me see. I think I have repeated in my script. Oh, I haven't, that's good. All right, apologies. I'm going to keep reading it. Courage is a self-affirmation of being in spite of the fact of non-being. It is the act of the individual self in taking the anxiety of non-being upon itself by affirming itself either as a part of an embracing whole or in its individual selfhood. Courage always includes a risk. It is always threatened by non-being. Whether the risk of losing oneself and becoming a thing within the whole of things of losing one's world in an empty self-relatedness. Courage needs the power of being, a power of transcending the non-being which is experienced in the anxiety of faith and death, which is present in the anxiety of emptiness and meaninglessness, which is effective in the anxiety of guilt and con condemnation. The courage which takes this threefold anxiety into itself must be rooted in a power of being that is greater than the power of oneself and the power of one's world. Neither self-affirmation as a part nor self-affirmation as oneself is beyond the manifest manifold threat of non-being. Those, those who are mentioned as representatives of these forms of courage try to transcend themselves and the world in which they participate in order to find the power of being itself and a courage to be which, which is beyond the threat of non-being. There's no exceptions to this to this rule. And this means that every courage to be has an open or hidden religious root. For religion is the state of being grasped by the power of being itself. And that's important because everything I spoke about here, and I even said that this book doesn't particularly talk about God all that much, or the Christian God at least, it's, it, there's no question about it that theology is absolutely vital to talk about our, both our finitude and our infinitude and our existential realities. We can't have, we can't even begin this conversation without theology. And, and a lot of the existentialists, even though a lot of the 20th century ones were atheists and irreligious, religious 
they were heavily influenced by religion, by the theological questions. Um, and there definitely is a mutual interdependence between theology and existentialism, philosophical, psychological issues. And in that sense, I would say, in the idea of confronting one's being, I've realized, maybe I didn't really get it from this book per se, but I realized from a lot of the kind of theology that I've been reading and the kind of experience I've been having in my life, in some sense, an atheist could be a more authentic Christian than a so-called pious Christian that just feeds into dogma, that, that, that just buys dogma. In, in, in that sense, that, that struggle, that, that, that facing of non-being, that, that acknowledgement of meaninglessness, meaninglessness and emptiness in this world, that, that absurd acknowledgement, sorry, the acknowledgement of the absurdity by an atheist in some sense could make them a more authentic Christian than a Christian who has never faced that reality, than a Christian who's just sheltered or naive, let's say. And, you know, Tillich has a very, very famous line where he says that doubt isn't the opposite of faith, it is an element of faith. And here's where Tillich ends the book, even though he doesn't go into too much detail on this, he goes into a lot more detail in his uh, systematic theology and dynamics of faith. For Tillich, for Tillich, at this point, when we understand our, let's call it, existential predicament and our, our position, we need the God above God who he defines as the ground of all being. And it's at that point we transcend. It's it's through the negation and through seeing the negation or, or, or through seeing the non-being, by facing the anxiety, by facing the meaninglessness, we we start moving towards the God above God, as he calls it. Um, and I read this really good commentary. I'll leave all these commentaries, even these two videos, which uh, by the channel Eternalized and this gentleman here, I think his YouTube channel is a rambling raconteur, uh, were, were really good videos on the book. I'll leave all these links down below, but a really good commentary I read on The Courage to Be explains this idea of the God above God this way. Well, each end of the dyadic structure of courage participation and individualization provide important resources for overcoming anxiety, fear, and despair. Tillich believes that neither pole is able to fully reconcile with its counterpart. A truly transcendent power or ground is, in, in, is needed in order to unite the two so that courage can be fully asserted in the face of anxiety and the threat of non-being. For Tillich, the solution takes the form of the, of the power of being itself. The ground of being, which takes the anxiety and threat of non-being into itself and transmutes its determinations. Tillich shows that this power has historically been referred to as God in Western philosophical and religious traditions. But he convincingly and persuasively argues that the power of being itself transcends the theistic idea of God and cannot be referred to in personal terms, i.e. as an individual among being amongst beings. At the conclusion of his argument, Tillich refers to, the, to this power as the God above God, because it enjoys that position historically attributed to God, but does not abide by theistic conventions. It is rather the ground and depth of existence from which the individual unites both ontological pools of courage and is therefore able to instantiate both self-affirmation, the courage to be as oneself, and self-participation, the courage to be as a part. That was a brilliant commentary on what, on how to like ends the courage to be. So this commentary just really is a commentary on the last line in the whole book, and I'll get to that. So the idea of the God above God, I'm still struggling with what this is, but to put it plainly, the theistic idea of God is dead for us modern people. The God of the pre-scientific era is most certainly dead. And the God that Nietzsche declared to, to be dead is dead for Tillich too. 
and it's at th this point in the death of this god that we go to the god above god the ground of all being and if not for again this is what what i mean by the the idea of a, an atheist could be a more authentic christian than a christian who professes to be a christian him or herself it's by acknowledging this negation this this meaninglessness with the death of god that one moves to the god above god and one in that sense becomes a part and sees the depth in the ground of all being and and one is grasped by it one is taken in by it uh i don't know what that really feels like yet i have intimations of it i certainly do but but i i i i i know what pilix talking about here i i, I certainly I, I don't i certainly feel it and that's where tilix says the courage to take the anxiety of meaninglessness upon oneself is a boundary line up to which the courage to be can go. Beyond it is mere non-being. Within it, all forms of courage are re-established in the power of the God above the God of theism. The courage to be is rooted in the God who appears when God has, God has disappeared in the anxiety of doubt.